Okay, so before, let's see here, let's go ahead and get this. This is really the resolution I'm going to be at. Okay. Great. All right, so um, real quick, how many people here are familiar? Well, how many people here have seen my PyCon lightning talk? Awesome. Okay, great. And then how many people are familiar with the grammar of graphics or the concepts they're in? Okay, a lot of people. Good. And uh, how about like protoviz or D3? How many people have kind of seen some of those things? Okay, so I'm going to be eat, like wasting half the room's time at any given point in time. But I want to make sure everyone's kind of on the same page and I want to really give some background on this. Um, basically, uh, Bokeh is a project to really, I think, uh, explore and advance the state of, of visualization of Python. Um, one of the challenges that I think the Python um, ecosystem is facing is that there are people, you know, we're here at the SciPy conference, but there are a lot of people using uh, the tools that we're all familiar with for things beyond just scientific computation. There's a lot of applications of, of Python, NumPy, SciPy for data analysis. And um, the plotting tools, however, for Python have traditionally come from a very scientific oriented background. And so uh, Matplotlib, for instance, um, is, uh, is very much inspired um, by the, the MATLAB style interface. I think most people here are probably familiar with the GNU plot kind of, that kind of plotting um, scheme. And uh, what's, if we look over the fence um, at what people, other people are using, uh, one of the things you'll see is that in the field of data analysis in R specifically, there's a really beautiful package called ggplot, which is an implementation of the grammar of graphics. I'm actually gonna skip to here. And this is a book that, was, that came out many, many years ago, actually. Um, but it lays out kind of a, a graphical pipeline, and it lays out a declarative way of building really nice plots, but primarily for statistical plotting and statistical data vi uh, visualization. Um, ggplot is an implementation of, of the grammar graphics for R. Uh, there's also a Java implementation that, uh, that, that I think came out with the book at about the same time. Um, and it's really, really um, very, very slick. For those who are not familiar with it, I'm going to just real quick show you some examples. One of the things that you'll see that's very different between something like ggplot and something like uh, matplotlib is that you just get a lot of stuff kind of, a lot of the configuration is handled automatically for you. And if it freaks you out because you want to configure all these various aspects of it, um, that's, that's okay. That's not the point of this. The point of ggplot to support uh, a lot of the use cases that, that data analysts have is to have very quick exploration and very quick navigation of extremely multifaceted data sets. So if you look at something like this, they're going from, uh, actually I'll start from the very beginning, where you have a very, very simple plot, uh, just showing some, some, some points. Um, kind of another example here, adding lines to it. Um, because R is, is kind of based on Lisp, there's this very functional kind of adding things together and things returning themselves kind of uh, uh, chain style of invocation. It's not, not, not quite like the imperative model of Python. But to go from that to having this really interesting plot now where all the dots are different colors based on what, based on a particular category of the data set, um, that's interesting. I think in most plotting toolkits that we're used to, that would be a few more lines than what's shown there. And then going to something like this, you know, again, it's very similar, but, but the lines are a different color now. Um, being able to color the lines and the points together. Um, and then the, maybe the most interesting, one of the most interesting aspects of the grammar graphics approach is being able to, I'm trying to find the, like this, being able to just um, very quickly add a statistical model and a visualization of that model and to be able to facet that on top of the data set and do this in about three lines, not even three full lines, right? So that kind of thing is really cool for data analysis. And so one of the, one of the, um, one of the challenges of implementing the grammar graphics is, um, is that it doesn't quite fit. Again, if you look at the way that it's written here, uh, it, the, the, the model there is very based on kind of R. And so um, I will show real quick what I managed to, to hack up actually at PyCon. Um, can people see that? Yeah, okay. So basically, if we look at, um, so this is, this is an implementation, a real quick and dirty implementation I did before PyCon to, to show how we can, can you guys hear that? Okay, to show you can do this on top of, um, on top of Chaco basically. And you can do this kind of 
thing, right? It looks very similar to what we saw there. And if you run this, um, you get a plot that looks like that, which is like, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting, but that's not that interesting, right? Um, but what you can do is, uh, you can, I mean, you can do some more, more stuff too. Here we're adding the faceting. So if you look at how this works, we're basically saying uh, AES stands for aesthetic, and so we're defining the aesthetic variables uh, of really X and Y corresponding to horsepower and weight for this auto mileage data, data set. Um, and we're choosing the color to be green for this particular plot. And so we're having two different plots here. Um, so this is so two different plots. One's green, one's the outline is green, the outline is, is red. Um, because it was kind of a quick and dirty job, I didn't go through a lot of detail in, in making all of the exact um, visual configuration variables match up. But you kind of get this, the sense of the, what you can do with it. But interestingly enough, because this is built on Chaco, this is really kind of a scripting layer on top of Chaco, you can go and do you know, all these fun things like adding tools to them. So um, I apologize to those who saw my, my PyCon talk, but this is a kind of recap of that. Here are these two, two things. Here is kind of a pan and zoom, just sort of the standard Chaco stuff. It's easy to add anything else that you've seen in, in Chaco world. It's easy, for instance, you can imagine taking the spectrogram demo. How many of you have seen the spectrogram demo at Waveform? Okay, so most people know what I'm talking about. Um, and you can actually just feed that into here, right? These are just Chaco components underneath. It's a scripting layer on top. Here's um, adding the regression lasso to this data set. I mean, these things just sort of fall out of the fact that this is all based, well, this is all based on top of Chaco. So that's, that's nice. But it still doesn't quite have, um, by, by the time of my PyCon talk, it didn't quite get to the point of having like faceting. That's one of the really nice things about ggplot is that you can do these multi, one of these days here, I'll get down to it. Okay, like this. Having a complex data set and just doing facet and getting multiple plots coming out of it, spanning kind of the, the, the space. Um, of categorical variables. And so um, I kind of, uh, I actually went and implemented that. And so we have like a facet grid here. Uh, we're again taking this auto mileage data set. Its uh, origin is kind of the, uh, the location where the car is made, cylinders, number of cylinders of the vehicle, displacement versus miles per gallon is what we're going to plot. And we're going to do a, a point plot. And so if we do this, whoops. I don't actually know if this is going to, if the screen is quite big enough. Well, it's not pretty, but it's, uh, it's pretty small. But um, you can sort of see it does this faceting. It's kind of omitting the areas where there's not a, uh, an entry in the data set for that. So this is nice. Um, I, you know, I don't have the tools turned on here, but you can easily see how you can do that. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen Chaco examples in the past where you have linked brushing across these things. All this stuff just works because it is still Chaco underneath. So I continued down this path for a little while, and the code actually is not that bad. I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show the code, but later if anyone want, wants to see it, I can show you the code. It's actually not that bad. It's really quite straightforward. But I ran into a challenge, which is that to do some of the more sophisticated kind of faceting, um, like the, the sorts of things that they can do very easily with ggplot, because they, they're based in R, and they have these expressions, uh, and they can play with these expressions and evaluate them kind of in, 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 in very... Um, uh, they can they, um, operate on these expressions in a first-class manner. There's a lot of things they can do that we have a hard time doing in, in the imperative world in Python. So um, I kind of stopped down that road, and I spent quite a while really digging into the kind of the deep architecture of how we would actually do ggplot in Python in a real way. And so if you look at a ggplot statement, what it actually contains is several different things all in one. And, um, and they use the power of Lisp to avoid having to separate them out, actually. So um, if you look at, uh, if anything I'm saying here is too obscure or is over your head, come to me afterwards and you can ask me about it and I'll try to explain. But if you look at a statement like this, this is actually doing several different things. It's, it's doing a structuring on the data set. It's taking a table, but it's doing a structuring on that table. And then what it's doing is it's actually um, attaching certain, vari certain um, geometry or certain kinds of visual things to almost queries in that structure. And so you take a table, you do faceting, you do sort of multi-indexing multi to get a cube. 
and then you automatically vectorize visual elements or entire plots or subplots or panels over facets of that cube. So um, having all of that all in one is, uh, you, can, you can't really hack that. You actually have to build a thing to do that. And so, um, like I was saying here, it's, it's really, really, um, you know, I, I don't get envious very often, but I do get a little envious of that, that they can just have these expressions and just really nicely play with them. Um, and so adapting or, or coupling these two things together requires us essentially build something that looks like a compiler, something that looks like you're building an expression graph, you're walking the graph, and you're building some other stuff that's then going to evaluate and run. And so um, the approach here is that uh, the kind of the new approach I took was to build out expression, actual expression objects, um, which basically do deferred slicing or do deferred sort of um, roll-ups or deferred uh, various kinds of faceting on on data cubes. And then when you call additional facet methods on them, they return additional deferred data cubes. Um, and then all of the plotting functions that you see in ggplot, all of those things are really just wrappers around, um, or they return rather nodes in an expression graph. And I'm calling those a plot expression node. Um, and what happens is that sometimes these plot expression nodes, like if you do um, an aesthetic and you want to you wanna facet the color uh, attribute, on some, some categorical variable. That particular thing creates both a plot expression node and it creates an additional data cube, which then downstream consumers use. So um, the, the geometry objects are actually the simplest objects. They're just a very simple configuration. Uh, they basically just represent a leaf node that tells the interpreter to say, create a plot here. But all the interesting things about that plot are really rolled up in the address of where that plot lives in that, in that uh, expression graph. Um, the aesthetic definition themselves, for the most part, are just dictionaries. You can kind of just build them up as you go through this, this builder. I'll show you the code of, of the parser for this in, in just a little bit. But essentially, this is the, this is the overall idea that uh, fundamentally, we can kind of build little hacks. But ultimately, if you're trying to, to, to take this expression and turn it into a real live kind of uh, plot, you have to, you're doing a compilation, so you should do it honestly. Um, now, one of the things that I also did, the, the, the PyCon stuff I did, very quick hack just to see if it was possible, see what it would look like, what it would feel like. That was extremely Chaco um, specific. In fact, the little pieces that I did, um, they are here in a directory called Chaco GG. Um, I, have a pl I have a pandas plot data object. Um, so, this, this is basically just subclasses from a Chaco object, right? And it, does, it has some faceting and stuff built into it. And then there's just basically a pile of these traits objects. And then ultimately, I have a ggplot object that has traits. And I'm just calling plot methods. I mean, the whole file is not very big, right? It's 350 lines here. And so, but the problem is that that's very, very Chaco specific. And the other thing is that um, I really, really wanted this to happen on the web. I wanted to make sure we had a client server model. I wanted to make sure that we had a way to turn this nice, beautiful stuff into uh, something that can embed an IPython notebook, something that people can share very easily on the web. So ultimately, we had to go to, or we, I decided that we needed to have a system that, um, that we have a, a set of front end objects that do the com compilation, do the interpretation, build up all of the stuff, but that's completely independent of any kind of rendering back end. Um, then the backend implementation has a builder, essentially. It's very much like an LLVM model, right? Continuing the theme of yesterday's LLVM love. There's this front end and the back end for this compiler. And the front end just builds up this AST. The back end then walks this thing and creates the appropriate objects. Right now, it's all Chaco based. But there's no reason in principle why it cannot back end to matplotlib artists, why it cannot actually generate a pile of GNU plot scripts for you, so on and so forth. Um, so the next steps that we need to do um, are uh, copying a lot of the, the style and appearance stuff, that stuff that takes 10% of the time but has 90% of the impact, that stuff we need to co copy over from the uh, ggplot. Um, how are we doing on time? Six. Six, okay, great. Um, copies it over from kind of the existing ggplot uh, library. Um, much better, I think, more robust integration with pandas. And what I mean by that is that um, when I show you the code of what I did, I sort of got halfway through implementing this stuff and I realized that what I needed to do was just extend some of the basic pandas classes and just make them support some deferred stuff and that would be it. Uh, as opposed to trying to build my own thing that basically mimicked all of the various methods that are already on uh, data frame and group by objects and stuff. Um, then the HTML5 backend, uh, there is some work happening on that right now, but. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, we can always use more help there. Uh, and the other thing that's really important is uh, how many people here are converts from R or have used R and, or, and ggplot perhaps? If you guys have use cases 
um, that would be super helpful. One of the things that you see a lot is looking at the documentation and all the various tutorials on the web for ggplot, they span a huge variety of capability, but when you talk to practitioners, they use about this much of it. So I want to make sure we get that much of it done first and done really well. So having the use cases from actual people that are using these tools uh, would be very, very helpful. And then just adding more features. Um, you know, uh, there's not that many features, but being able to add additional features like linked brushing, interactivity, all these various things that, that we, we have kind of in the Python space, really imparting them kind of, uh, or, or expanding them and, and enabling them with this kind of spelling. That's, that's uh, kind of the next steps there. And then um, I want to show the code real quick, and then we can go to questions. Um, I want a hardware switch on my laptop for black or white background. That's what I want for terminal and for Vim. Um, so like I was saying, this is the plot expression node object. Uh, it's really simple. It just looks like anyone who's ever written any kind of compiler is going to see something like that. Um, the plots, the faceting, the aesthetics kind of build up some of these attributes. Um, the geoms are actually really, really simple. Geom point, geom line, there's bar and, and some of these other things. Um, they're pretty straightforward. There's a, you know, a small tweak that they can sometimes have built in aesthetics that you have to add to the style sheet, but on the whole, it's it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, this you know the representation of this stuff is not not very hard, um, and if you look at the the functional interface for it, they're just building you know these these are the functions you would actually implement into your namespace, and they're just building up these little objects. Um, the real work happens in the back end, where we have a builder context that's building up information about you know where you are right now in the tree. Uh, as it's walking down, the, the, or in the graph, I guess, as it walks down the graph, um, applying the various um, attributes, depending on what kind of plot you want to build. Um, and then really using, uh, you know, using, using the data values that you're getting out of the data cube to vectorize plots over, um, over the input data. And that's actually worth showing as well, the, the data graph. Um, one of the things that you see in R, or in using ggplot, is that you're doing a lot of um, these data, I guess they're sort of um, data space operators, what would you call it, like cross, nest, blend, you're really doing a lot of these, these sort of set operations. And so um, we have to implement those or represent those in the graph so we can reason about what they do to the vectorization when we go to do the plotting. So, um, and then this is the part, this is when I say more robust integration with pandas, this particular data cube object that I was building up, I started realizing that if I could do kind of do a refactor on it and, and sit much more nicely with, with pandas. So um, anyway, one thing just to, as a teaser I want to show, this is a, for those who, who didn't see it, um, this is a, a video of, this is a video of basically um, exporting, this is related but not quite the same thing. This is showing, this is a video showing uh, a Chaco plot which has an export button on it. And this is using um, the flowers example um, from D3. And when you hit export, it, it saves out an HTML, which you can then load up in your browser. And the kicker is that you get linked brushing as well in the export. And so this is the sort of thing, this is again, this is demoware, right? This is something that we put together to, to see that this would work. But this is the direction that we want to go with this stuff. So you can basically be writing this Python code um, doing nice plots locally, but then at any point being able to export and have an interactive uh, web version of that plot. Um, the other thing is, uh, real quick, how many minutes? One, okay, questions. Uh, yes, in fact, that was going to be the slide I was going to bring up. <laughs> it's asking for questions. Um, I actually have to do a push to that. I'm moving it from my, my own repo over to the Continuum one. So um, this is like an old copy that was done. I need to do a push of the latest stuff. But um, I'm, going to do that as, I'm going to do that today as soon as I'm done with the talk. Uh, any other questions? I'm going to be doing, um, I'm going to be working, sprinting with people on this. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask, do you have any thoughts about how you handle sort of the large data decimation? 
I have many thoughts on that, actually, uh, more than what I think 30 seconds will allow. But, uh, but one of the goals of the, the, reason, the reason for doing this pipeline, for doing this, this graph, is that then you can reason about what happens when, change, when data changes. If, you get a new, if you, you're fasting this direction, but you get a new category popping up in your data table, right? If you have the graph, you can, you can actually reason about this. Um, likewise, the nice thing about the grammar graphics is that it is a specification of what I want, not how to do it. And so you can see the user wants to see this statistic on this kind of data. And you can, if you have large data, you can figure out how to decimate that actually at a much, more, much higher semantic level, uh, how, to, how to roll it up or reduce it. And that's the kind of thing that you can imagine GIS data being able to zoom down and see you know, uh, states and counties sort of showing up as you zoom in more. Um, those things are only possible if you specify the graphics you want at a level that's, very, that, that's more semantic than I think most of the plotting toolkits that we have now, which are very, draw this thing here with these values, right? It is a pipeline-based approach. I think the VTK pipeline is really, really, um, I wouldn't say it's heavyweight, but there's like 600 something classes there or something, right? I mean, it's like it's really, really big. And um, it sort of has the same problem as the MATLAB. Like, Chaco is actually not quite the MATLAB style. It's a very object oriented pipeline based style like VTK. Um, but none of them have that quite, quite or the, at that semantic level where a data analyst can say, just this data, facet along these things, just show it to me, right? And that's, that's, that's an area that we are hurting uh, a bit in the Python space when we're you know, making inroads there. Wes? Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. That I mean, those are all sort of really nice directions we can go once we kind of have a framework for reasoning about about the, the representation of plots, kind of at a, at a semantic level. I'll use my moderator's prerogative. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't think the, the plotting toolkit itself should handle that. One of the things that I completely, um, I realized I only had 20 minutes and not like 35, but there's a whole section of slides that you saw me skipping over talking about protoviz. And the original title of the talk was actually about the extensible, uh, you know, an ext extensible grammar graphics. One of the things that the, GG, the ggplot does not do is once you get this geom, whatever, once you get this geom point thing, you're done. You're just, you're done. That's what it's going to do. And so in a sense, it's a scripting layer on top of still a schema-based plotting system. So you're saying you have, pl you have points available and bars and lines, and that's it. Um, Protoviz com goes a completely different direction, right? You're scripting individual um, little attributes, visual attributes, and you can do whatever. You can compose really beautiful, wonderful, and interesting things with a very small set of, of, of components. So um, last year, what I was talking about was sort of going down this rabbit hole and ending up realizing we needed a better NumPy, really. We need a better sort of data handling system that handled out of core, that handled distributed data, that lets you do deferred uh, computations and so on and so forth. Um, in a sense, uh, this here sort of kind of variations on a theme. Um, if we just do that same sort of thing for the kind of data that, that Pandas is exposing, right? So data cube, tabular oriented data, um, supporting OLAP sort of things in Python, then you sort of have a unified system where you can go up or down, handling distributed data, handling out of core data, um, but being able to talk about that and do plots on it and write plot expressions and have a system that can actually reason about what you want to see on that data and maybe, like I was saying, be able to do semantic downsampling on that. So that's, that's, it's a lot of work, right? It's a hard problem, but there is an approach at least, I think, that's, that's a good one. I guess that's all the time we have. <laughs>